gosh, you would have thought I would have learned from the 9 o'clock service, but I didn't. I'm a little bit out of breath. I don't know about y'all, but I was giving everything I had down there on that front row. That song, whoo, so good. Caught me off guard at the 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, you know, they kind of lulled you into that little kind of grace thing, kind of had a little soft hit, and then they hit that one. Dang, God, everybody watching online, I don't know what y'all, I'd have been running around my living room. I've been doing all kind of crazy stuff. Neighbor would be seeing me go by the living room window like, what the heck is he doing? <laughs> Running laps, man. That stuff, that's just good stuff right there. A lot of people see me up here doing messages and stuff, and they think I'm a high extrovert. I am not. I, it takes all the E I got to do these messages. I'm about a 50% extrovert. So after these messages, I go home and I die for about 12 hours. <laughs> just pass out, sleep, you know, it's, it's, it's all I got. I love meeting people. Oh, man, you're, so, you're an extrovert just like me. I'm like, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Nope, I love this. I love engaging with you guys, and it is awesome. But then the way I get refilled from that is not engaging with more. It's like I got to go home and hibernate. That was just so daggum good. So good. Well, my name's Eddie Tilly, and we're excited to have you here this morning. And I'm just, I'm just loving this season of life we're in. We're not locked down. Summertime's coming. We're getting out. We're doing stuff. Oh, Yeah. Last Sunday, my wife, you know, is sort of, after I did my nap, after I had my, I don't know, five and a half, six hour nap, after I had my nap, she's like, let's go for a walk. It's such a pretty day. I said, let's do it. I said, let's don't walk around this daggum neighborhood. I ain't nothing to see in this neighborhood. Let's go to the beach. So we went to Sullivan's Island, right on down there, station 29, 28, something like that. I forget what it is. I'm going to tell you, I am fully embracing my maturity. It's another, another word for old manness because I, I went right out there. I rocked it. I went right out there to the beach, Sullivan's Island, with my black warm-up pants, socks, and tennis shoes. I don't care. Don't care. Just walking out of, you see my socks, you see, I don't care. I don't care. You know, I'm doing what I want to do because I don't care. I like it. It's just freedom in that. You know, it used to be, oh, gosh, I got to wear my, if I'm going to do that, I got to take everything off and be barefoot. No, no, no. No, I do what I want to do now. Who cares? I also have set myself some uh, weight losing goals. I'm trying to lose weight. If you hadn't noticed, act like you have. So, <laughs> yep, yep. So I've got a goal for myself. I want to lose 20 pounds by the end of May. I started in the beginning of April. I want to lose 20 pounds by the end of May. That's a good goal, right? So I've only got 30 more pounds to go, and I'll be I'll be right there. Woo! Yes. All right. So let's get in. Let's get into this weekend. You know, last weekend. We started a new series, weekend after Easter, our uh, senior pastor, founding pastor, Mike Lewis, yeah, he launched a message called No Regrets, and I'm going to tell you all what, man, it was good. If you weren't here, you have got to watch it, and even if you were here, it's one of those, go back and watch it again. It was just loaded, with. So, it was like he just beautifully set a table in front of us of how to live a life of no regrets. And I can't review the whole message. I would love to, because, but then that would be the message because that would be all we have time for. But I do want to review a, a physical illustration that he did that I thought was excellent. And it's, he was using this, this ball of clay and talking about the plan that God has for our life and how a lot of us believe that. We believe God has a plan for our life. But a lot of us also believe that when we sin, when we mess up, when we make a wrong choice, when we make a wrong decision, well, this plan is no longer valid. That was plan A, and now we're on plan B. And then, obviously, we're going to mess that up. We're going to sin again. We're going to make a wrong choice. Now we're on plan C. Now we're on plan D. And what he was talking about is how, for most of us, we believe that, and then we believe each of those plans kind of diminish, right? Obviously, B is not as good as A. C is not as good as B. So the plan now of God for your life gets diminished. I would even say even beyond that, it's not just the plan. I think that for most of us, myself included, you know, you mess up, you do whatever, and that takes a piece of it away. And now we're at plan C, you take a piece of that away. And now we're on plan D, you take a piece of that away. And you keep doing that. And I think for a lot of us, it feels like the plan gets smaller. But I also think there's something on the inside of us that's broken that makes us feel like we get smaller, so not only is it the plan of God now is no longer the optimum plan for my life, but now I have been diminished as well. And what Pastor Mike was showing is that's just not true. And it absolutely does not line up with what the Word of God says. What the Word of God says is that he has a plan for your life, and because he's sovereign, because he saw every single day of your life before you ever breathed a single breath, and then what he did was he wove all that sin all those bad choices, all those bad decisions, he wove it into his plan. 
I was talking to a good friend of mine who uh, was part of this church when I first started coming back in 1990, um, and then some things happened, and he went away, went to uh, another congregation, and he's back now, and just literally right before here, we were talking, he's like, man, sometimes I wonder, what would it have been like if I just stayed? I said, but you know the beautiful thing is that God knew that was going to happen, and he just wove it in. It's a part of the plan. It's not second best. It's not the next best thing. It is God's best because his plan does not change. And so I want to read this passage of scripture that illustrates what Pastor Mike did so beautifully um, last week. It's Romans 8.28 from the Amplified Bible. It says, And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purposes. So today, I want to do a second installment on this No Regrets series. And I want to sort of begin by saying, if that's what you desire, if you desire to live a life of no regrets, Christianity is your only option of faith. There is no other option of faith if you want to live a life of no regrets. And here's why. Because every single faith, every religion other than Christianity is predicated on what you do for whatever God. Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, whatever gods, whatever it is that they're worshiping, that faith is based on what you do for that entity, that God. Christianity is 1,000% predicated on what God has done for us. So if you want to live a life of no regrets, this is your only option. It is your only choice. And I love that. I think that's just, man, that's just... What else? You know, what else can you do? Because God has done so much for us, and you could take the totality of everything God has done for us and boil it down to one word. And I believe that one word is the key component to living a life of no regrets. Unfortunately, that word is elusive. It is very, it's almost like mom guilt, right? Like, I don't care what you do, yet to this day, nobody has come up with a method proven to get rid of and eradicate mom guilt. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, that thing is always right there. Well, in the same way, this word is hard to fully embrace. It's hard to really grasp and get a hold of for your whole life. So to the point to where if somebody could figure out how to do either one, if you ever can figure out a way to totally eradicate mom guilt or totally figure out a way to get everybody to fully embrace this word that I'm talking about, you would never have to work again for the rest of your life. That one word is grace. It is the grace of God that helps us to live this life of no regrets. So let me read to you the way Tony Evans describes it, because he he describes it so well. He says, Grace is the inexhaustible favor of God, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, what we do not deserve, and what we could not earn, and what we never could repay. It's what God does for us, independent of us. It emanates from God to us, without us. In other words, you can't do anything about it. You have No say-so whatsoever in the grace of God being poured out on your life. None. You can't stop it. You can't shut it down. You can't turn it off. There's nothing that you can do. Christ died and went to the cross and he went down to hell. He defeated death, hell, and the grave and God raised him from the dead. And when God resurrected Christ, it opened up God's grace over all of mankind. And you can't stop that. Nothing you can do can stop that. So... Here's the interesting thing about grace. There's over 155 references to grace in the New Testament. 130 of them come from one man, the Apostle Paul. And the reason being, Paul was passionate about grace. Grace was his entire... Paul was a very simple man. And I'm going to show that to you right now. Before Paul met Jesus, he was a very simple man. It was all about the law and following the law of God. 100% he was passionate about it. And then he met Christ and something changed. So let me read to you Paul's description of himself and why grace is so huge. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. Paul says this, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me. That's the grace piece. As a prime example of his great patience with me, even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. In other words, Paul is saying, look, 
if God can forgive me after what I did to him and then use me to be arguably the most important key figure in the New Testament save Jesus, then he can for sure use you. Because Paul, before he met Jesus, was the chief persecutor of the church. When Christ rose from the dead and all of a sudden people began to put their faith in Christ and churches started popping up everywhere, the church of Christ was born, Paul made it his life's mission and passion to hunt them down, arrest them at best, or at worst put them, or at best put them in jail, at worst have them killed. Because he viewed every single follower of Christ as a blasphemer absolute blasphemer, enemy of God. He said Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. He was not the Son of God. And I'm going to shut this thing down because you are an enemy of the church. And then one day he's on that very mission, heading to uh, Damascus. Orders in his hand, permission to go and round up every Christ follower he can find. And he encounters Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. I can't imagine what that was like. Because I don't know how many people up to that point who were followers of Jesus that he had had thrown in jail. How many of them had lost their life because of him? He probably thought, that this, that's it, I'm dead. Because Christ said to him, I am Christ, I am the Messiah. Why are you persecuting me? And he forgave Paul. And Paul probably would have been fine just leaving it at that, but he said, Paul, I need you. I need you, I have a plan for your life, and I need you. And so Paul just wrestling, how, A, how could you possibly forgive me for what I've done, but now you want to use me? you got something that you want me to do? I should be spending the rest of my life paying for what I've already done. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand. That's done. That's, you need to, I, need you to, I need you to put that behind you and act like that never even happened. Because as far as I'm concerned, it didn't. All that matters now is moving forward and what lies ahead. Paul understood that better than anybody. So let me read you a few phrases about mercy. Because you heard him say, God had mercy on me. And as a part of it, it's not the same as grace. They're different. And these statements kind of help draw the distinction between the two. Mercy withholds what we deserve. Grace gives us what we don't deserve. Mercy pays the penalty of our sins on the cross. Grace substitutes the righteousness of Jesus for our wickedness. And I love this one. Mercy closes the door to hell. Grace opens the door to heaven. And I, I think most of us believe this. I really do. I know, I know I'm talking to a lot of believers in here. I think most of us understand grace. I think we, we get it. I think we know what grace is. And we're totally cool using it for everything that happened yesterday. I don't think we have a problem applying grace to our past. I don't think we have a problem applying grace to our life before I knew Jesus. I think we all struggle with applying grace to our life 24-7 of walking in an understanding that the grace of God is something that you can't turn on and off and that God doesn't turn on and off. We are literally living in what the Bible calls the age of grace. The church age is the age of grace. Christ opened a window over us that nothing can close. And there are things pouring out over our lives that that's what we need to be focused on and that's what we need to be aware of. So that's my goal for today is trying to get us to a point to where we take that grace that, is, that seems to be easier to use after we've paid for whatever it is, you know, after we have our sin or we make a bad choice, after we feel like we've spent enough time, you know, in the dredge, you know, beating ourselves and all of that. Now I can go in and get the grace of God. And grace, like, God's like, man, you're, your life is going to be such a struggle if you live it like that. And so the goal is to get us to where we live with that Grace consciousness 24-7. Let me tell you a couple of stories that just really illustrate grace well. One of them is from Denise Thomas. She's a member of the congregation, a friend of mine. Great story. Oh, my gosh. She's got these two little kids, Noah and Peyton. And she tells a story about how they were shopping at Michael's. And so she said to her kids, all right, look, if y'all behave, if y'all do good while mommy's in here shopping, then when I get done shopping here, we'll go to PetSmart so that you can see the animals, play with the animals, do all that. They're like, oh, that's awesome. So she said they did phenomenal. They did great the whole time she's shopping. And this wasn't quick. She's up and down all the aisles. She looked, and they were just perfect little angels until she headed for the checkout line. How many of you parents know that the checkout line is occupied by demons? <laughs> there is a demonic atmosphere at the checkout line. She gets to the checkout line and they just lose their stuff. All of a sudden, it's like, wh whose kids are these? 
They're just going back crazy, man. And she's trying to figure out what, to the point, and a lot of you parents can identify with this. I know my wife can, to where she just left that cart right there. Come on. That's it. That's it. We're going. Boom. We're out. Takes, leaves the cart right there at the checkout line, heads out of the car, just mad as fire. What? In the, I don't understand what they're thinking. And in the middle of her anger, she hears this, taking the pet smart. Oh, heck no. Uh-uh. No way. We had a deal. You do this, and then I'll do this. So no, they're not going to PetSmart because they're acting like a bunch of crazy banshees right now. And we're not going to do it. They don't deserve to go to PetSmart. Again, she hears it. Taking to PetSmart. Oh, that's God, dadgummit. <laughs> mm. Get them in the car, driving to PetSmart, turn into the parking lot, and the kids are like, Mommy, what are we doing? Why, why are we going to PetSmart? Like you, you said we could go to PetSmart if we behaved, and we didn't. We, that was bad. We, we, we did bad. We should, uh, and then one of them goes, oh, my gosh, I know what you're doing. You're showing us grace. You've been teaching us what grace is about, and now you're showing us grace. You're giving us something we don't deserve. <laughs> what parent wouldn't give a million dollars for that moment with your kids right there? Oh, well, I, yeah, I got another funny story. I can't tell that one. I'd be going contrary to what I'm trying to get across. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Another story. This one's phenomenal. You may have heard of this. This is a story of Victoria Ruvalo and Ryan Cushing that happened back in 2004 in New York. And uh, Victoria was on her way home late one night from her teenage daughter's, uh, is either a dance or a music recital. She's on the way home. And Ryan Cushing is in a car full of teenagers. And they had been up to no good all night. They had stolen a credit card, used that credit card to buy a bunch of stuff they shouldn't have got. And then they got a bunch of groceries, not for the purpose of eating them, but to use them to do bad things, one of those being a 20-pound frozen turkey. So as Victoria is coming in the other lane and they're passing them, Ryan leans out with the turkey and throws it at her windshield. Now, luckily, she doesn't remember anything that happened after that. The turkey, the turkey came through the windshield, hit the steering wheel, bent it into her face, and completely shattered her face. Um, so lots of reconstructive surgery, titanium plates, titanium screws, and the social outcry against Ryan was, un I mean, you can imagine, this is New York. So they're like, you know what? He crushed her face. Somebody needs to crush his face. Her life is never going to be the same again, so he doesn't even deserve to have a life. Put his behind underneath the jail. He needs to feel the full weight of what he did. That is just senseless, absolute, absolute senseless evil. Fast forward a year, 2005, in the courtroom. Victoria is there. Ryan is there. Ryan has pled guilty to his crime. The judge asked him to stand for the sentencing reporters are all in there, New York reporters. The judge starts to deliver the sentence. Six months in jail. What? Five years probation. What? A little dash of counseling, a little dash of community. And the reporters are irate. Again, they're taking a social media. This one guy who's from New York, he was in a 9 o'clock service, he, came, he said, do you know the story you, you, t you said is true because I deal with New York reporters all the time and they have a saying. That is, if you don't have anything good to say, let me hear it. That's what they do. That's the, way, that's the way they handle it. And they did. They went to social media. Who is this judge? Where did this Yahoo come from? Does he not understand what that boy did? That boy needs to feel the full brunt and weight of his crime and what he did. He has ruined this poor girl's life until they found out why the sentence was so light. It was Victoria. Victoria stands up, holds her arms out. Ryan starts to sob. He's sobbing so hard he can't see because of all the tears. So his lawyer has to literally lead him over to Victoria. She embraces him and she whispers into his ear, I forgive you. That's mercy. And then she said this, I want the rest of your life to be the best it can possibly be. That is grace. So much so that those hardcore, hard-pressed New York reporters, that was what they dubbed the headline, a moment of grace. I love what St. Augustine says about grace, and when you have that picture in your mind, it makes so much sense. He said, God always pours his grace into empty hands. We don't have anything to offer. 
Not when in comparison to what God gives us, we have nothing. And yet he pours it out on us freely, more than we could ever imagine. One more story, the Golden Gate Bridge, early 1930s, construction begins. And of course, back then they didn't have the technology or the apparatuses that we do. So there was no way for guys to be tethered off as they're like walking up and down these cables. So a lot of men fell off that bridge and lost their life. And so you can imagine that that only has to happen a few times. I think there were 10. And then finally they're like, okay, we've got to do something because production was moving so slow, obviously because they're scared to death for their life. And this is in the early 30s, so jobs were hard to find. And this was a good paying job. So people wanted the work and they wanted to be a part of this monumental project. But the fear of dying was so great, it was just shutting everybody down. So they had an ingenious idea. We'll build a net. And so they did. They built a net that completely went underneath the Golden Gate Bridge and went far enough out on both sides that no matter where you fell from, that net would catch you. They even had a cool little nickname for people that had fallen in because a lot of guys still fell and were caught by the net, and they called themselves the Halfway to Hell Club. (laughs) So I guess that's a little bit indicative of how they were living their lives. I'm like, gosh, Halfway to Heaven would have been nicer, you know, but I, I don't know. So, they, so, so that net now, because of that safety, now I'm not saying they weren't scared when they fell. I guarantee it's like, hey, I'll see you all tomorrow because i got to go home and, and wash everything I'm wearing. <laughs> but they knew they weren't going to die. They knew that net was going to catch them. So productivity increased immediately 25%. So what if you and I could, by 25%, increase our awareness of God's favor on our life every waking moment, 25%. What if we could get rid of whatever that fear is that gets in our head that God is going to, you know, get us or judge us or what? What if we could reduce that by 25%? Let me read this verse to you from 1 John chapter 4 in the Amplified Bible. This is John talking. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, that is complete, full-grown love, drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. And this is what Paul was all about. Paul was all about, you've got to get it. You've got to understand the difference between living your life underneath the fear of this divine judgment of God being against you because of your, your failures and your sin and get and understand the full compassion of his grace that is being lavished out on you. That was the whole ball game. And that's what Paul talked about in every single one of his letters. And so Paul tries to lay it out in Romans chapter 5 going into chapter 6. This is like the crux of the whole thing. So he's trying to put it in words in a way that people can understand. He says this, All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. Paul said, look, I get it now. He said, for some reason in my mind, I thought that that God gave us the Ten Commandments as a solution for what had happened. Now I realize the Ten Commandments didn't solve anything. Now I realize that, honestly, my life was fine until I read the Ten Commandments. Because the truth is, none of us need to be told from the Bible that you shouldn't kill another person. None of us need to be told that you shouldn't steal what somebody else has. None of us needs to be told you shouldn't sleep with somebody else's spouse. We innately know that. It's in our DNA. So then why put it in print? Because God was trying to show me, you're not going to make it. You can't live this perfect life. And Paul says, thank God we don't have to because Jesus came and he did that for us. So let's keep reading in that same, this is that same passage. But sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. All sin can do, listen to this, is threaten us with death and that's the end of it. That's what the enemy does all the time to you and I. That is is his MO. That is his modus operandi, man. That's the way he operates in our life. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But just remember that. All sin can do is threaten us with death, and that's the end of it. And keep in mind, Paul's writing this to believers, okay? These are people that have put their faith in Christ. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through the Messiah, invites us into life. 
a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? Paul knew that's what people were going to think he was saying. And, and he was right, by the way. Because Paul's biggest battle is he would go somewhere, he would start a church, he would explain grace to them, they would fully embrace it, and as soon as they left, these men would come in behind him and go, oh, let me guess, Paul was here, right? And he told you, just go ahead and do whatever you want to do because God's going to forgive you and it's all okay. And that's not what he was saying. But that's what they accused him of saying. That's what they tried to twist his words. Paul himself answers that argument. He says, so should we keep on sinning? He says, I should hope not. If we've left the old country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? So Paul's kind of painting this mental picture. Hey, you used to live in the old land that was ruled by the law, and that is a land of condemnation and death. If you are not in Christ, you are in the world which is already judged and condemned because of sin. That's where you were living. But the moment you accepted Christ, you packed up and left there for good. Now, I think a lot of us left that land and we're in the new land. But I think a lot of us, when it comes to our house, I think we did what any good Goose Creekian would do. That's what, that's what, you know, I'm old school Goose Creek. I'm living in this land over here. Awesome. You're going to take me to a new land? That's cool. Hey, I got a new house for you. Dude, this is a perfectly good house right here. I'm going to jack that sucker up, slap some wheels on it. I'm going to pull it right on over here. Heck yeah, I need to buy a new house. I'm going to bring that house with me. I like that house. That's what Paul was getting at. He's like, look, man, you can't do that. You can't live half in, half out. Because to whatever degree you, you live over here, I don't care if you just stick your little toe in here, it is death. It is always going to produce one thing, and that one thing is death. It's going to tempt you because over in this land, you know what you're responsible for? Nothing. Nothing. You're responsible for saying, I accept Jesus Christ and what he did for me as my Lord and Savior. And the moment you do that, the grace of God is over your life. And you can't turn it off, can't shut it off. I don't care what you do. But it's so tempting to come over here and say, yeah, but I want to do something. I feel better about myself when I do this. I feel better about myself. There's nothing wrong with feeling good about doing good things until you get to the point to where now that somehow ties into your identity as a Christian. Because even on our best of days, what we do is nothing in comparison to what God does. So, what do we need to do? We need to live our life with the understanding of that, that, that net that is underneath our life, that aggressive forgiveness. That I love that word, aggressive forgiveness. It's not God sitting back and waiting until you mess up. It, it is a picture that just, I mean, what if we could, here's how the enemy operates. Remember I said how he works as he uses that old nature. The way the enemy works is the moment you get that first thought, what it is, let's, so whatever your sin is, whether it's pornography or drinking or drugs or whatever it is, you get that first initial thought, and you all know what it is. You can all recognize it the moment it comes. Nothing has happened yet. You haven't done anything yet. But the moment it comes, the enemy tries to get you to say, don't do it. Don't do it. No, don't do that. Don't do that. No, that's, that's bad. You shouldn't do that. And what he's doing is he's turning you towards that law. He said, man, if you do that, that's bad. If you do that, you're going to mess everything up. If you do that, God's going to be so mad at you. And it's just not true. God already knows everything you're going to do. And he's already provided the grace sufficient to cover it. So what if in that moment, that very first moment, when the, first, when the thought first enters your mind, what if your first reaction was, man, God loves me. Man, he's got an incredible plan for I mean, God loves me. So even right now, that thought just came into my mind. But what I know is happening is God is just loving me and pouring out blood. He loves, he's got this phenomenal plan that I can't even fathom. And I promise you there is a lot more life-giving and a lot easier to say no. But I'll also promise you this. If you, if you stay on this track, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Don't. You're walking. Don't do it, don't do it. And you're focused. Don't do it. Don't. You, you can't. You, grace is back here somewhere. You're totally focused on this law thing and what you shouldn't do. And that's exactly where the enemy wants to get all of us. All right. John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Amplified Bible. For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, gift heaped upon gift. For the law was given through Moses, but grace... The unearned, undeserved favor of God and truth came 
through Jesus Christ. So we're not saying that you ignore what the truth is. We're not saying that you ignore sin. Jesus didn't. When Jesus encountered the adulterous woman, he encountered her with grace. He encountered her with aggressive forgiveness. He didn't even entertain what all had happened. He, you know when he dealt with her sin? At the very end, when everybody else had walked away and he said, who is here to condemn you? She said, no one. He said, I don't condemn you either. I forgive you. Now go and sin no more. That's truth. Go and, and don't sin. But the only way you're going to get that is if you're going to live in what, you, what just happened between me and you, that exchange of this aggressive forgiveness that I have for you. Because when you live with that, that grace consciousness instead of that sin consciousness, you're going to be in a life that is so incredible, you're not going to want it. You're not even going to be attracted to the sin side of things. So think of grace as like a fire hose. It's like a fire hose that's attached to heaven and is just gushing out these spiritual blessings and this favor. All of this just lavished on you. Better than a fire hose. Niagara Falls. Think of that. Think of living your life underneath the grace that we've been reading about. This is what it feels like. Unmerited, undeserved, unfavored, gift, heat upon gift favor upon favor, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, 24-7. You can't shut that. This is all God. You have nothing to do with this. This is all God. This is what Jesus being resurrected from the dead did. It opened up a window where heaven is pouring out on us and no power in hell or on earth can turn that off. I think some of you think, oh man, when you mess up, God's got a big old valve and he shuts it off. And then when you do good, he turns it back on. Or you think when you mess up, you go get your little umbrella and you get up under it. I know God's not blessing me. Man, that thing's going to destroy your little puny little umbrella. God wants you living with that level of awareness and consciousness. That this is what's going on independent of you. It is his grace. That's why it's so hard for us to grasp because we didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it except for this one thing. You and I are his kids. We are his kids. He said, man, if you love your kids as much as you do and you're willing to pour so much into their life and you are a fallen person in a fallen world, what do you think I want to do? I want to lavish you with all of this. So let me read that verse again with that visual on the screen. For out of his fullness, the super abundance of his grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, gift heaped upon gift. For the law was given through Moses, but grace, the unearned, undeserved favor of God and truth came through Jesus Christ. Gosh, Eddie, I don't know. That's hard, man. It's hard to comprehend. I know. Me too. Me too. I would love to tell you that I live my life constantly all the time. I don't. But the good news is it's something that we can grow I struggle with it. Anybody else in here struggle with it? Yeah. You know who else struggled with it? Peter. Peter. My man walked with Jesus. Now Paul comes along after Jesus died was resurrected. Peter walked with and he struggled with it. So I want to read one more passage of scripture to you that Peter was writing to a church. He's writing to encourage him because they were underneath persecution from Nero, the most wicked emperor that Rome ever had. So they were enduring terrible, terrible hardships and crimes against their people. And they just wanted Jesus to come back. They said, we, did, we don't understand. What is God waiting for? We know that Jesus is going to come back. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to make everything right. And so Peter is trying to help them understand why God is waiting, A, to let his son come back and put an end to all of it. But then he's also trying to help them understand this idea of grace that is pouring out from heaven. So this is what Peter says. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That's the whole reason for the waiting for Christ. Because once Christ comes back, that window of grace shuts off. And this world is going to experience things that none of us in this room want to be here for. Because that grace will be shut off from the earth and then it will be judgment 
pouring out on the earth. It will be wrath of God pouring out on the earth to judge wickedness and evil. So Peter's like, God wants to give every person opportunity to make that decision to put their faith in Christ. He said, this is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, he's talking about grace. Some of his comments are hard to understand. Even Peter admits, guys, look, I struggle with getting what he's saying. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different. That's those men that would come in behind him. Just as they do with all parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. You already know these things. You know about grace. We've taught you about grace. We've taught you to be aware of what those guys are saying. So be on guard so that you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people that are trying to make you go back to a life of law and rules and regulations. Paul was trying to teach us that we don't do that. Even Peter struggled. Peter and Paul had confrontations with it. Paul called Peter out because Peter had a time in his life after the resurrection where he had one foot in this law side and another foot in this grace side. And Paul said, what are you doing, Peter? You can't do that. And definitely you can't do it in front of these believers. You're going to mess them up. It is about one thing, grace and grace only. He says, rather you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what Peter was saying. He's like, look, guys, I know it's hard to understand. I have a hard time understanding it, but this is what I know. God gave that message to Paul, and there's not a doubt in my mind. There's not a doubt in any of the disciples' mind. We all are 100% behind Paul when he says it is all grace and no law. We are 100% behind him. And we know it in our heads, but it's hard for us to understand in our hearts. But the good news is we can grow in that understanding. We can practice it. We can learn how to continually remind ourselves that the grace of God is pouring out over our life, irregardless of what we're doing. The grace of God is always there. So I know that's hard to understand. I know it's a hard concept. So we're going to take just a breather right here. You've heard a lot about grace. Hopefully it's starting to clear up, but let's sing this song and just allow that to kind of churn on the inside for a little bit. So let's worship together. You can be seated just for a moment. Well, Eddie, I hear what you're saying, but that might go well for a lot of people in this room, but you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea the depth of the depravity that I've been involved in. Can I just tell you what the Bible says about, put that waterfall back up there, that grace. Tell you what the Bible says about that grace that pours out right there. Paul says, wherever sin increases, God's grace increases all the more. So I don't care where you've been, I don't care what you've done. You can't overpower that because that is God. And it is what he has done. I want to read this passage of scripture to you out of Romans chapter 3. It makes it as simple as I can possibly make it. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without the keeping of the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. It doesn't matter who we are because we've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. But yet, God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. And He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin and people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. So I'm just going to ask if you would to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you're in here and you've never done that, you've never put your faith in Christ, it's just that simple, it's just that easy, and I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to embarrass you at all, so this is not something where later on you're going to have to you know, go talk to people you don't want to talk to or be seen by people you don't want to see by. This is strictly between you and God. And if you're like, Eddie, I, I didn't know it was that easy, but I need that. I need Jesus in my life. I want him in my life. I need that kind of life-changing grace. I'm just going to ask you, if you would, in the room and online, if you're online as well, would you just lift your hand up and just let me make eye contact with you? Just me and you, just let me make contact with you and agree with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Up in the balcony. Thank you, sir. I got you back there. Right here. Anybody else in the room? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. All the way back there in the back. Anybody else? Thank you. If 
you're online, thank you so much for responding. Everybody's eyes bowed and head closed. We're just going to pray this prayer. But for all of you guys that raise your hand, this is your time. The, the door to hell is going to be closed. The door to heaven is going to be open. And the grace of God is going to lavishly pour out on your life. Would you just repeat this prayer after me? Father God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay the penalty for me. And he rose from the dead to open the window of heaven over my life. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give those guys a big hand? Yes. And so now for everybody that raised your hand, I want to read you this quote from Dr. David Jeremiah from his book, Captured by Grace. It's so good, and this is true. It's true for all of us, but if you raise your hand, man, you just step right into this. Such grace can only come from God. It is the gift unsought, unmerited, unlimited. For no matter what we've done and no matter the depth of our transgression, the darkness of our hearts, grace overrules them all. God pursues us relentlessly. He does not give us up. And once he has captured us, so everyone that raised your hand, God has captured you and he will not let you go. He will not let you go. Amen. So a couple of things. One, along those same lines, especially those of you that raise your hand, is our growth track. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. A lot of times people hear growth track and they think, oh, what's that about spiritual growth? But what it's really about is giving you the tools that you need to embrace this kind of a life because that's hard. That's a hard shift. It's hard to do. So some of you in this room, you just raised your hand. Some of you in this room, you've been in a church for a long time, but you've still been living in that old mess. And you need some tools to help you get free from that. That's what the growth track does. It's four weeks long. And in four weeks, you're not going to discover your divine purpose. But we're going to give you tools to help you discover it. You're not going to find the the big, major, overall plan God has for your life. But you're going to get the tools to find out what that is and to take that journey. And you're going to connect with people that are just going to love you and encourage you. as one of the best decisions you'll ever make. You're going to hear our DNA, why we do church the way that we do it. And I promise you, you're going to hear stories in there that will absolutely prove to you that God pursues us every day of our life. He is relentless. So I would love to see you guys sign up and take part in our growth track. The other thing is our offering. And as you're walking out today, if you like to give in the room, the giving stations are in the back of the room and you can give there. A lot of you give through our app or through the website or through text to give. Just want to say thank you. And I just want to say God bless you for honoring him and for trusting him with your finances, for being faithful to him, for recognizing that he is God. And so just bless you guys as you give today. And in the very last thing, stand for this if you would. Next weekend is Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day in advance to all you moms. And you don't want to miss that service because Pastor Megan Turner is bringing that message next Sunday. So God bless you guys. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.